congratulations, gentlemen, the top three drivers in the Austrian Grand Prix 1999. Eddie Irvine, David Coulthard, and Mika Hakkinen. Eddie Irvine, you've beaten both the McLarens, which after yesterday's qualifying and today's warm-up seemed unlikely. Are you su as surprised as the rest of us? Um, I'm surprised to have beaten them, yeah, but uh, at the same time I knew we weren't a second off them yesterday and I knew we'd be closer. You know, I reckon really yesterday we were about half a second off. And today, normally in a race we go better, and I thought, you know, if we get the strategy right, we can um, do the job. You won the race in the extra laps you were out on your first stint. It was absolutely demon laps. Did you just go as fast as you could, or did you have a target of time to gain? No, I drove around as slowly as I could, you know, well within the limits of the car, just to make sure it got with... No, of course, that, that's the time you've got to make the lap times, and I'd actually been saving fuel at the start of the race. Um, and I was hoping it wasn't going to break down because at that stage I was going very slowly and I was behind Barrichello and the Italian press, if I had broken down them, would have murdered me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just had to save fuel and try and save the brakes and that's what I was doing. And then I started pushing and pushing them and Barrichello went in. That's when I really put the, the hammer down and uh, that was, that's what got us ahead of DC. Now, towards the end, Dave was closing right up on you and we saw some smoke in the, uh, in the TV uh, pictures. Was there a problem? Yeah, uh, probably coming from my brain. <laughs> it, was over <laughs> it was overloading with, you know, because with, with problems with the brakes and um, the car was just understeering like a pig, um, really, in, in the, on the second set of tyres and I was just struggling to do lap times and then it started to get a bit better. But uh, we still had the brake problems, so I had to um, ease off and DC caught me a bit too quick, so then... I had to start pushing down and just forget about the brakes. Thanks, Eddie. David, congratulations on second place, but a controversial first lap. Perhaps you could talk us through it. Well, obviously, uh, this is my uh, nightmare scenario. Not only have I taken my teammate off at the first, uh, the start, I've uh, you know, finished second to a Ferrari. So, obviously, I'm uh, very sorry for running into Mika, but I um, misjudged that corner. And then the rest of the race was just a case, I guess, of... Uh, Eddie being quicker on those last few laps uh, after the stop. Did you know Eddie was quicker then? Was the team telling you to go faster? And were you just constrained by weight or something? Well, I, I knew just before my stop that I was starting to lose a little bit of time in traffic and uh, I lost, I think, two and a half seconds behind Zanardi driving slowly around the middle of turn six and I had to run wide offline there and the other one off the circuit. So it just came at the wrong time and uh, obviously that was crucial time for, for staying in front of Eddie. And in those last few laps you closed up, did you think you had a realistic chance of passing if you had got close enough? You, you've got to believe there's always going to be a way through somewhere. If you can get there and uh, if someone makes a mistake, then there's always a chance of getting through. Dave, thank you. Make her a fantastic drive from very disappointing circumstances. You're dead last. You come third. Well done. Talk us through it. Well, you don't really expect me to tell from the start to finish, you know, that was a couple hour program, but, <laughs> but you know, it, it was, it was after all, the end of the day result was uh, acceptable, you know, like I said before the race, to come here to score points was important, and we did that. Uh, whatever happens in the first corner, we have, well, second corner, uh, that's not now important uh, at the moment in this situation, but, uh, you know, uh, generally, uh, the, the overtaking again other cars, uh, racing against the other drivers uh, was again very enjoyable. I think that uh, organization here in Austria did a good job in terms of blue flags, so uh, it may, made the racing extremely interesting for me. Now, Mickey, you say the second corner doesn't matter, but do you feel you've lost six points or it gained matter, four? It matters, of course, but there's no point to now to start explaining it. <laughs> Mickey, thank you. Eddie, you're now just two points behind Mika in the World Championship and obviously you established yourself as a very credible Ferrari team leader. Going on to Hockenheim, is low down for something that's going to suit the Ferrari? <coughs> well, I think um, we did a test at Monza and uh, we made very, very big steps forward there, you know. Um, very surprised how, how much time we found. So, um, Hockenheim, you know, it's a different circuit from Monza, but these guys, we know they're going to be quick wherever, wherever they go. But um, as, you, as you've seen today, we can beat them even though they're that little bit quicker. Thank you, gentlemen. And now, Mika, a word in finish, please. Hello again. Fast Eddie has delivered at Spielberg in Austria. A magnificent win for Eddie Irvine, replacing Michael Schumacher as Ferrari number one. And just take a look at that. Eddie Irvine closing right up on world champion Mika Hakkinen. Just a couple of points in it now. And Frentzen fourth. David Coulthard scoring again today. 28 points. And Ralph Schumacher made a rare mistake in that race, staying on 19 for Williams. And um, in the constructors, well, we, we thought that Ferrari might lose that lead for the first time this year. They've clung on to it, just two points in it still 
obviously thanks to Eddie Irvine and Ron Dennis before the break there, saying that that early instant cost McLaren a victory. Tony Jardin, we said a couple of hours ago, we always get a good one in Austria, and once again, Austria's delivered. We do, but I was so pleased to hear Ron Dennis saying that that's a racing accident. We allow them to race. They are equal joint number ones. And David Coulthard has said, I've caught the wave now. I'm back up with it. And, and he was great throughout the race. Obviously, Hackenden was mighty coming from the back like he did. But what yeah. entertainment that was. Nevertheless, before we see exactly what happened there, there at the start, there will be a major inquest. It's very rare, certainly since we've been covering it, two and a half years, to see two cars from the same team crashing into each other. It is very rare. This goes back to Senna Prost days, Prost Mansell days, and especially tapping each other. That can mean the end the sort of quite good relationships between drivers, the end of technical cooperation. You noticed on the podium there, Hacken and kept his distance at one end, Coulthard was in the middle. Coulthard getting worried and sort of getting ready to stuff uh, books down the back of his pants, as you'd uh, suggest. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Go for a whacking Ask boy. Mr. Dennis's study, yeah. Come, come and see us straight away. I mean, Martin Brunner described as a loving kiss, that between Hacken and, and, and Coulthard. The relationship seemed distinctly frosty on the podium, didn't it? Yes, it was distinctly frosty. And this, this is how it was all caused from the very start. Now, it's interesting at the start, because although they got away clean, just look at Coulthard, he refuses to give up, going down the inside there, has another look, and really, Hakkinen has to keep that brake pedal off that little bit longer, and they're heading uphill again and down to the Remus curve, which is the fast of all. Now, if we look here, you'll see that Mika Hakkinen takes the classic racing line right out to the outside, still tempted, David Coulthard racing away on the inside, the inevitable tap. He didn't do it on purpose, it was distinctly a racing accident. Behind him, of course, the concertina, all happens. Herbert got rammed from behind by Mika Salo. Now, here it is again. The door is wide open. There's temptation, there's that tempting fruit on the tree for David Coulthard. And he has a go. He's racing. He's got a sniff of it in the inside, and why not? Now, if Hakkinen has got the grumps on about it, then that's it. They should hopefully bury the hatchet off it. Look at it. The sand trap on the outside, and there's Herbert's wing spinning atop of the tarmac. It's a low grip track, there's no margin for error. They are all concertinaed up. I'm surprised there weren't more accidents there. That shows the lightning re reactions of 22, the world's finest racing driver. What a sad, sad time for Johnny Herbert. He went so well leading up to the race. He went brilliantly right at the end, Murray saying he did a fantastically quick lap in the Stewart, but uh, he just, things just seemed to happen to him at a time when his position is under threat. He needs good luck. We need him to stay around because he's never really been able to show his full potential. He's a naturally gifted racing driver. He's been struggling in qualifying to stay up with Rubens Barrichello. But the changes to the Ford Series engine, the changes to the car from Gary Anderson and all his crew mean he's now up there. They've asked him to smooth it out, start thinking a bit more about his laps, and he's coming right. Some terrific little cameos, as always, within the Grand Prix, and a wonderful drive from Mika Hakkinen from the back. He just ripped past everybody. He could have got extremely angry after that incident, uh, but this is controlled aggression. You can see him coming for Damon Hill's 13th place early in the race. Damon has no alternative but to let Mika Hakkinen through, the current world champion, and just, just the points leader in 1999. Yeah, that's right. It was, it was interesting, I think Martin Brundle pointed out, he, how he relied on Heinz Harold Frentzen when he overtook him. Yeah, he did now. This is, this is quite sort of disappointing here, but this was as Irvine came in. Now, this was lap 44. This was absolutely brilliant piece of strategy. He had stayed out for the longest, the last possible moment, you can be assured that Ross Braun, the technical director, was looking out at the track, waiting to see when it was clear, giving him some track time. In he came, the very last. So he must have used that last drop of fuel. But this is Eddie Irvine. We've seen him at his best today. And there he came out, the yoke removed from his neck, the responsibility, the burden, some thought, of being number one. And he's taken it all on, and he's delivered. I wonder what Schumacher's thinking about with his leg up there in the old hospital bed. Yes. He told him, he said, uh, go for it. Mate, just go for it. Yes, absolutely. No, I, th I think that uh, Michael Schumacher is due to give a press conference this evening. Perhaps we'll find out a bit more exactly how he thought uh, about it. But, I mean, once again, Ross Braun, that, that strategy, keeping Irvine out for so long, has paid off. I'm quite amazed by that, really, because, you know, there's the tyre wear to take into consideration. There's the heavy braking on the track. But we're also, we mustn't forget the reliability of the Ferrari. You know, they've got the updated engine on there. The aerodynamics is slightly inferior to the McLaren. But that whole package together, plus Irvine, 
unruffled, unflustered, has just put together an absolutely brilliant job today. Well done to him. Yeah, absolutely. I think we can uh, return now to Austria, where Louise Goodman is talking to the uh, uh, Ferrari maestro, Ross Braun. Ross, the boy done you proud today. Yes, yeah, he did an excellent job. Um, beginning of the race, you're never quite sure where you're going to be because we didn't know how much fuel McLaren had on board, and he just started to drop back a little bit. But then as the race, the middle of the race developed, we realised we had a chance. Um, Coulthard came in four or five laps earlier than us, and uh, Eddie knew what he had to do, and he did a great job. McLaren kind of played into your hands with the incident at the start. Yeah, we can't complain about that, obviously. Mika was very, very quick in, uh, when he did have a clear track, so I'm not sure what would have happened if uh, he'd got away, but um, yeah, these things happen. We had a problem with Michael um, Silverson. They had a problem today, so uh, that's the way it evolves. We rarely see you up on the rostrum. Did you enjoy your visit? Yes, it is a rare visit, but Jean kindly asked me to go up there, so uh, I uh, enjoyed it very much. Well done, Ross. Thanks very much. Yes, well done indeed, the two friends got a glimpse of Sonia Irvine, Eddie's sister, who is the physio at Ferrari. Now, I mean, in all honesty, Tony, we must start talking about Eddie Irvine now in terms of a possible world champion. Yeah, because uh, there are so many things going wrong for McLaren and for Hackenden, and that's causing the low scores. I mean, if you think about it, uh, Hackenden's wheel fell off at Silverstone. Steady Eddie, Irv the Swerve, whatever you want to call him, he's there and he's been the constant threat. But he's elevated his own position because he's also been allowed to test the car this year. He's been helping develop it. He's using some of his own strategies, his own setups on the car for the first time. And all that's now coming out. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel people are a bit coy about Eddie Irvine. I mean, you can't have it both ways. You either have a driver who comes out, says things and gets people at it, or you have someone who mumbles away and does the old, you know, the, the, the speak and, and is pretty boring. Now, with Eddie... <laughs> You're talking with Eddie, about Mika <laughs> At least he says something. At least he goes on the record, isn't he? I, I must say, I thought Eddie had gone a bit far this time okay. be because he needed, to, he needed to drive as fast as he talked. But he's actually done it again today, so he can say what the heck he likes as far as I'm concerned. But he has said things like he was criticised by Jean Todd, and I noticed Jean Todd didn't go up onto the podium, by, by Jean Todd for missing his point in the pit stop at Silverstone, yeah. stretching the crew and losing the race because of that extra two seconds. He said he wasn't even there. Yeah. Why criticise me? He'd gone to hospital to see Schumacher, he had, which well, he had. Well, just talking, talking about Schumacher there and the possibility of him coming back, I mean, how much will Irvine's success, might it influence when Michael Schumacher comes back? Well, to be very honest, I think Schumacher, if he comes back in three or four races' time, Eddie's bound to be that far ahead that he will assume the number two role and he'll have to back up Eddie Irvine. Eddie would love that, wouldn't he? I think the world would love that. I guess so. I cannot somehow see Michael Schumacher as number two to Eddie Irvine, but there we are. Uh, <laughs> we had wonderful cameos in the race. The finish, Tony, with... British drivers battling it out for those maximum 10 points. Yeah, uh, this was great. Now, Eddie Irvine under pressure, you know, he was locking up the brakes. Those half com hard compound tyres have taken a lot of pressure. Then we've got to remember that from Brazil onwards, there's been huge needle between these two. And uh, Eddie Irvine had, had accused Eddie Coulthard of driving a car. That's easy to drive. It's like, you know, trying to shoot rabbits with their feet nailed down. He had said that David Coulthard's value was going down race by race. Little jibes all the time. That's the psyche. That's the way Eddie, Eddie works. Absolutely. Just talk, talking about David Coulthard there, I and mean, we're not sure what was happening with his car, but there was a distinct lack of pushing on, distinct lack of pace in the middle part of the race from David. Sometimes there are inconsistencies between the sets of tyres. Sometimes when the fuel load goes down, the car does a peculiar thing. It is known that uh, David Coulthard is not that happy with the rear end of his car. Um, they have tried to improve that for him, and, and it has been improved to a certain degree. Um, but I, I'd still like to know the real answer myself, why the lap times are going up and mm. down. Hopefully he'll, he'll tell us um, through the press conference. Let's hope so. Well, of course, we will be hearing the three drivers in the press conference uh, very shortly, and we'll also have the result of our competition to win a free trip uh, to Monaco next year when you rejoin us. Had a great race around the Spielberg circuit in the Styrian Alps in Austria. A British one two as well with Irvine and Coulthard and world champion Mika Hacken in third. They've been talking in the press conference. And let's just uh, eavesdrop now and hear what the big three have got to say. Eddie Irvine, you let's explain it. <laughs> Mika, thank you. Eddie. The explanations that will probably follow in the McLaren motorhome, I would imagine. Um, a, a little gag from Mika in.
press conference there, despite those sort of miserable circumstances. Yeah, I mean, it, it's strange, because um, normally we just get the sort of speak your wake machine, don't you, with mm. the uh, staccato stuff coming on. But he is trying hard to, yeah. to get the odd crease and smile into his face. I think he's gritting his teeth after that uh, result today. I think so. That, that, that's fair enough. Um, a nightmare, David Coulthard described it as, taking his teammate off there. He's taking it very badly. You can see that in his body language. You can see that in his expressions, in his face. And uh, he's clearly steeling himself for uh, a healthy discussion, of you, as you've said, back at the motorhome. Because, you know, it is a team effort as well. It is McLaren against Ferrari. Ron Dennis does want to win the World Constructors' Championship as well as the World Drivers' Championship. And they've got a great chance of doing that this year. And if you hand something to the opposition through a mistake like that, there are bound to be some sort of recrimination. And deep down today's uh, winner, Eddie Irvine, he talked about his brain smoking as opposed to his tyres or anything like that. He will find a little private room somewhere and go, yeah, I he showed will. you today. But, but you know the other great thing about that is he hasn't changed his training regime whatsoever considering the weight of being number one. One of the things he says, I play hard and I work hard. The day after the British Grand Prix, he got into his Learjet, he went off to Greece to... to go on to a photo shoot with his new Dutch uh, model girlfriend to go and see her for a day. Unheard of. Is Eddie Irvine in love? I don't like to upset the girls out there. But for Eddie Irvine to jet off and go and see a girl on a it's beach... It's got to be unheard. serious, isn't it? Flew back that day, having had ten minutes in the sun, and watched a quick photo shoot, and immediately went testing. Mm. And uh, then he went off to his boat and, and had a few drinks with his friends. But off, isn't it? That's absolutely. It is an everyday day for Eddie Irvine. Let's just check on one or two facts and figures for you. The Austrian Grand Prix. Here is the result and of course the points. Eddie Irvine, 90th Grand Prix, 10 out of 10 for Eddie. David Coulthard leading for quite a large percentage of the way. The Silverstone winner second, but great to see the two British flags right up there at the top. Mika Hacken and world champion picking up four points for McLaren. Heinz Harold Frensen, so consistent to uh, for Jordan and Wurtz, best of the season for the Austrian. He'll be happy with that on home ground and Pedro and is making his point for Sauber. And this is how it looks uh, after nine rounds of the Drivers' Championship. Mika Hakkinen just two points clear of the charging Eddie Irvine, Michael Schumacher, who might well not race again this year. Frensen just three points behind Schumacher now. David Coulthard, a point behind Heinz Harold Frensen. And Ralph Schumacher, a rare mistake from the younger Schumacher today on 19 points. And the constructors, well, I'll tell you what, it really is a heck of a scrap up there. You can see why it's uh, so tense between Ferrari and McLaren. Just those two points separating Ferrari and the reigning world champions McLaren Mercedes Jordan heading for their best ever season clear third now Williams fourth Benetton who've been pretty disappointing it has to be said so far the former world champions well off the pace and Stewart up there in sixth let's just talk about um, that uh, team championship shall we shall we Tony I mean it often tends to be submerged beneath the individual drivers but a real ding-dong battle going on it is the most important thing to the team owners because that's their pride and their joy. That's, that's the engineering side of it. That's the feat for them to actually win that. And, of course, if you look at the, the record for Williams Grand Prix, they've got 103 Grand Prix victories. But they've got nine World Constructors' Championship in the shortest amount of time possible. Ferrari started you know, in 1950. McLaren started in 1966. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a huge pride and rivalry between the main constructors on that. And in that, I was surprised, as you said, Ralph Schumacher, poor old Ralph, he turned the corner last year at the British Grand Prix. Mm. Prior to British Grand Prix last year, we were saying to each other, I don't think he's going to make it. He's mad. He kept flying off the road. Right. He got sixth place at the British Grand Jordan, Prix a year ago. Do you remember that? Yeah. And he came back. He had fifths. He had second place uh, in Belgium behind Damon Hill. He's already had two third places this year in Australia on the podium, in the podium at the British Grand Prix. And by the way, he survived a huge flood. There was a lot of rain in Austria this weekend. Testing at Monza last week, he was with his manager, Franz Toast. Franz Toast went under this tunnel, there was a lot of water, misjudged it, went in there, the car floated away, the, it filled up with water and had to open the windows to let the water in and then float away. Mm. Franz, soggy Franz toast, toast at the end yeah, of that, was soggy toast, oh, I just did toast. your gag there, I could see that one coming from so far back. <laughs> no, we call him burnt. <laughs> <laughs> the crowd making their way from the circuit there, 
Well, I don't know, mixed feelings, I would think, uh, for the crowd, but lots of Ferrari banners in there. Look, as always, and delighted that uh, Eddie Irvine has delivered, delivered those 10 points for Ferrari in the absence of Michael Schumacher. Okay, then, well, now the answer to our competition. The big prize, of course, a VIP trip for two to next year's Monaco Grand Prix, and the question had a Monte Carlo theme. We want to know which British driver has the most Monaco Grand Prix victories. A. Sterling Moss, B. Graham Hill, or C. Jackie Stewart. And the correct answer was B. Graham Hill, Mr. Monaco, five times winner in the 1960s. And our big winner, it's Donna Owen from Stoke-on-Trent. I look forward to meeting you next year in Monaco, Donna. Two runners-up, Robert Fellows, winning a Jacques Villeneuve race suit, and Sandy Dennison, a tour of the Stewart factory. And our thanks to the Stewarts and Williams for the prizes and to thousands of you who entered and provided funds for leukaemia research. Let's have a, a word, shall we, about um, Heinz Harold Frensen, um, who's, I mean, had a very, very good season. But there was a moment when he was overtaken by, by Mika Hacken, and I think you felt sums up Heinz Harold a little bit. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's very fast, he's very consistent, and he's, he's made a brilliant comeback with Jordan this year, having been really kept down uh, and I think sort of hounded at Williams and, and criticised openly and heavily for his lack of driving performance. But where I, d I think he lacks it is in the kill in the defence mechanism, in the overtaking manoeuvre. He tends to let them through. He was a little bit more defensive today, he was a little bit better, but my mind goes back to France, when it was a huge tactical victory for the Jordan team. OK, he drove brilliantly in the wet, but if you remember, when drivers were coming up behind him and Hackenham was coming up behind him, etc., he left huge gaps, he left huge barn doors open where people went inside him. And the, the picture then immediately flashed over to the pit lane where Eddie Jordan was and he was going... Mm. No, and you could tell that's the reaction from the team boss, so taking your lead from that. But yeah, apart from that, you know, there's a weakness in every driver's arm. That, that's just his weakness. He has done a fabulous and job. And he's done a great uh, job for Jordan this year as well and fourth today again. We thought the Stewart's going to be in the points until um, Rubens Barrichello, well, that brand new engine blew up in spectacular style. Yeah, that, that was a great shame. Again, they have had a step two package from Silverstone onwards, which is totally revised side pods, revised diffuser, revised suspension, and Ford have come up the CR1 engine with this Series 3 revised engine. That includes having what they call this periscope exhaust, which come up and over before the rear suspension and, and in front of the rear diffuser. What that does, it gets the hot air away and avoids the hot air going under the airstream where the diffuser is and upsetting the balance of the car through the hot air. The car was very, very competitive, very, very fast indeed. You've got to feel sorry for Rubens. What happened? The suspension broke on both of them in Monte Carlo. He had a puncture at Silverstone. He reckons without that bad luck, they'd have been ahead. They would be ahead of Jordan by now. Absolutely right. He's having a, a tough few Grand Prix. He's a Brazilian, very likeable fellow too. Well, it's a back-to-back -back Grand Prix for us. And uh, next weekend, it's the German Grand Prix at Hockenheim. And next weekend, we launch an exciting new feature. Martin Brundle's F1 driving school. And he's giving away a few secrets. German Grand Prix. Martin Brundle's F1 driving school. The driver's secrets revealed. No secrets today. An absolutely brilliant finish to the Austrian Grand Prix. The Austrian Grand Prix in a magnificent third position. An outstanding finish to a great race. Highlights tonight at 11.45. And back-to-back -back Grand Prix, remember, qualifying from Hockenheim next Saturday afternoon at 3.15. And the race will be live at 12.15. Now then, Tony, just sum it up briefly for us. Two points in the World Drivers' Championship, two points only in the, in the World Constructors' Championship. It's the closest season we've had for a long time, and it hasn't even reached the boil yet.
Absolutely, Tony Jardine, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, of course, for your company throughout the afternoon. I don't know, Eddie Irvine, he's always talked a great race, hasn't he? One or two people criticised him leading up to the start today in Austria. But Eddie Irvine, remember, replacing the irreplaceable Michael Schumacher, has driven an absolutely magnificent Austrian Grand Prix, and now he's right in line for the world title itself. We'll see you next weekend. Bye-bye for now. points of the world champion Michael Schumacher becalmed on 32 Frensen scoring again Coulthard now within one point of the German don't discount the Scott and Ferrari front runners all year in the constructors just hold their lead thanks to Irvine three more points for Jordan hometown boy Wurz scoring a couple for Benetton another magnificent Austrian Grand Prix and drama right from the start Tony no question about that. And uh, David Coulthard, Mika Hacken, and on pole position. Coulthard on the inside there. He'd run over that inside of the track in warm up to try and clear it up. He looks down the inside early on on that very first lap. He was having a go, and Mika Hacken had to stay off that brake pedal a really long time. Irvine sneaks into third place. But Mika Hakkinen, for my man, stayed out very wide and late there on the classic racing line. A little gap had opened up, a temptation for David Coulthard. Not his mistake. He knew he had to go for it early on. A little tap on the rear wheel of Hakkinen there. And as a consequence, the field bunching up behind poor old Mika Salo on his debut. And poor old Johnny Herbert, with his car going so well, got uh, punted up the rear there and lost his wing as a consequence. McLaren bosser Ron Dennis refused to blame anybody afterwards in public. What was said behind closed doors, would you think? <sighs> well, there, there would be some recriminations because obviously it is a team effort at the end of the day and they have handed a victory for Ferrari. If Hackenden could have got away, he may well have done it. Who knows? But um, all's fair in love and war. What's your magical moment from this afternoon's Grand Prix? Well, I mean, Hakkinen skying through the field, as he did, but coming across Jean Alesi. For me, Jean Alesi, or even though he was on a two-stop strategy, look at this, Hakkinen in ninth place, eighth place there, Jean Alesi. Now, you think Jean's going to look in his mirror and say, oh, for goodness sake, I'll get out of the way. No, he's going for physicality, he goes for the jugular, he dives inside the two men who were on the front row last year and took each other out a year ago. Bang! Alesi goes through to seventh place. Hakkinen has to bide his time and tread very carefully. Mm, very much a team effort, as we always say. Wonderful strategy from Ross Braun and brilliant work once again from the Ferrari pit crew. An Englishman, Nigel Stepney, who I work with at Lotus, is the man in charge of that pit crew at Ferrari. He's been there now for six years. Look at them, well drilled. And Irvine had stayed out to lap 44, the very last, so they put all the fuel, crammed it into the tanks of the Ferrari. And Ross Braun had looked out, waited till the empty track came up, and there it goes. Out comes Eddie Irvine and into the lead of the Austrian Grand Prix. And we thought, oh, it's not going very well, the Ferrari isn't going very well. We didn't know it was so full of fuel and they were going for that incredibly late, late charge. Mm, wonderful achievement for Eddie Irvine here, answering a lot of his critics. Yes, it is. And he's taken that huge pressure and weight of Ferrari onto his shoulders, taken the number one. By, by the horns, if you like. Look at this and this pressure he's soaked up here. David Coulthard gets the Irishman to lock his brakes up there. He gets a scent moving into the kill because he smells that tire smoke coming into his visor. There's the last lap, last corner. David, can he get past? Can he get close enough under that rear wing for a slipstream? No. 0.3 seconds at the end in it. One of the closest finishes I've seen for a long time. Two-time winner now, Eddie Irvine. He is absolutely delighted with that. Puts him on level terms with Johnny Herbert, who's also won two Grand Prix. Well done, Ferrari. Well done, Irv. Mm. And just finally, it's all building up to a terrific uh, second part of the season, isn't it? It really is. And, uh, you know, we haven't come to the boil yet. Low-scoring championship. There's going to be a lot of action ahead. Tony Jardine, thank you very much indeed. And here's your complete rundown. Irvine's second Grand Prix victory. Coulthard second in Austria for the third year running. Pole sitter Hagen and third with the fastest lap. Frensen fourth, same as Silverstone. Wirt saving his best for home. Diniz once again in the top six. One lap adrift. Trulli, Hill, Salo's Ferrari, 
Panis and Genet. Fisichella's engine failed, but Doa was three laps behind the unfortunate Johnny Herbert four. Zonta's clutch failed. The non-finishers, Barrichello's engine blew, Alessi ran out of fuel, De La Rosa's brakes failed, and Zanavi, very embarrassing, also ran out of gas. Defective drive shaft for Villeneuve, still no finishes for the 97 champion. Takagi's engine gave up, and Ralph Schumacher made a rare error for him. Next weekend, we go to the German Grand Prix, ran the very quick Hockenheim circuit, blasting through the forest, qualifying 3.15 on the Saturday. We're live for the Grand Prix from 12.15 on August the 1st, and our build-up, by the way, includes the first instalment of an exciting new series, Martin Brundle's F1 Driving School. So we head for Schumacher country without the main man, but Ferrari's new top gun, Ireland's Eddie Irvine, has shown he's very capable of charging all the way to the world title. Good night, you all. If you'd like to know more about Formula One, the website address sponsored by Level 3 Communications is www.itv-f1.com.